Hello, this is Larry Butler, and I'm on Promoter 101. Don't be afraid to step right up, ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages. The circus is about to begin. See the extremely rare concert promoter with acts filling seats in venues across the East Coast, leaving piles of money in his wake. The Bowery's Jim Glancy is with us. Turn your eyes to the perfect mix of beauty and brains behind ICM Partners. The enchanting Megan White is with us this week. Next, take sight of the amazing human teddy bear. Very cute and cuddly, but beware of his death-defying grip and power of persuasion. From Rocks Off, we've got Jake with us today. Step right up. Promoter 101 is about to begin. That's Dan Steinberg, everybody, going full P.T. Barnum for you this week. The full circus shide show bar opening this week's podcast. Welcome to episode 44, Promoter 101. I'm Luke Pearson. Of course, that was Dan Steinberg. Dan is right. It is a big week. We're going to be joined this week by Bowie Presents Jim Glancy. We're going to talk about everything from Brooklyn Steel to the Sale Day EG. We also got ICM Partners Meg White on to talk about this agency success. And our buddy Jake from Rock Soft. He's going to turn the tables on us. And of course, we'll catch up with the news of the week. Hey, everyone. This is Cindy Lynott. Kira Finkenberg. Patty Ann Tarleton. Whitney Bond. Amy Miller. John Holiday. Marcy Allen. Paula Palazzo. Becca Leifer. Sarah Mertz. Julia Frank. Zariel Hyatt. Ali Spagnola. Alex. Marsha Vlasic. Andrea Johnson. Appearing live on Promoter 101. Get ready. Promoter 101 is coming to a town near you. Western Arts Alliance, the WA Conference in Seattle on Thursday, September 7th, with the Triple Doors, Scott Champino, ICM Partners, Andrea Johnson, and just added, Tommy Emanuel and Andy McKee's manager, Brian Penix, will be with us too in Seattle. Berkeley College of Music, popular institute, we're coming for you, uh, will be in Boston on Thursday, October 12th. IEBA Conference in Nashville, Monday, October 16th, it's on like Donkey Kong. And in between all then, keep up with us on Twitter. Dan is at the Jew. The show is Promoters, that's plural, Promoters 101. And I'm at W. Luke Pierce. If you have any feedbacks or thoughts about the podcast, we want to hear from you. Send us an email with your ideas, thoughts, positive reinforcements to Steiny at Promoter101.net. We guarantee one of us will respond to you to every email because that's how committed we are to this world of the podcast thing that we do. And be sure to subscribe to Promoter 101 wherever you podcast. Please, please, please help us spread the word about this podcast by telling your friends. If you missed any of the podcasts, you can always catch up at Promoter101.net. This week, we feature a reissue of Episode 4 featuring Red Light Management's Stuart Ross with a cameo from TKO's Jim Lenz and APA's Steve Ferguson. If you haven't heard it yet, it's new to you. This is Marsha Vlasic, and I am president of AGI Talent Agency, and I'm on Promoter 101. It's time for the news of the week. Leading off this week in the news, some news from Monterey. Monterey International's agency, California office, is going to come full circle, moving back into its original digs with an acquisition by Paradigm Talent Agency. Dan, in my next life, I'm going to start an agency and sell it to Sam Gores because I really think that's the best way to get days. Paradigm's just been so splashy in acquisitions over the past two and a half years. You know, I we've got to see a way for them to really bring this all under the Paradigm banner and build a behemoth agency, which is what they've done. Yeah, they're one of the big six at this point, and you got to. It just makes sense. Fred and Dan and Paul all on the same team again. It makes a whole lot of sense to me. I don't know why they didn't come along with the deal originally, but I'm sure it feels just like family all over again. Congratulations to Josh Knight and Goldman and Swanson and Lima and all the cats. Congrats, guys. UTA has given up their Canadian digs by announcing they're closing the office up there. I predict right now Ralph James, Jack Ross, Zed, Rob, Adam... They're going to come back in matters of moments, figure out where they're going to be, because those guys are not retiring. And you know, I don't get the logic behind what UTA was doing here, Luke, but 
Those are some massive agents. I mean, you're talking about the guys that have Nickelback. They know what they're doing. Those five or six guys that you rattled off, Dan, comprise most of the shows that are sold in Canada. So if you're going to be uh, an act that's touring North America and the the you know twelve percent of it that is the Canadian market, you really need to be going through those guys. So I really don't know what UTA was thinking on on their end of things. Rob Zifferelli, like man, City and Color. I think he has them for the entire world, at least for all of North America. He has got such a big future ahead of him. Jack Ross is an icon, and Ralph James is in the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. I mean, you're talking about players here. News in that AEG and Bowery Presents are no longer booking the Bowery Ballroom or Mercury Lounge in New York. The owner of Bowery Ballroom and Mercury Lounge is parting ways with that booking team that Bowery Presents, paving the way for a potential takeover from Live Nation New York. Dan, what are you thinking about this? I mean, we got Glancy on the podcast this week, and Honestly, we recorded this before this news was broken, but if the Steiny Ballroom was booked by anybody else but Emporium, it would be a little weird. So it's their namesake. This is shocking to me. You know, we have to consider what piece of the chain they're giving up here. Mercury is what, a 250 cap room? Bowery Ballroom's 500 cap room? These guys just opened up, you know, a couple thousand capacity Brooklyn Steel. Do you think Bowery Presents is looking higher up the food chain and, and focusing more of its efforts on a longer tail play here rather than trying to develop the club system? Or is this a misfire on there into things by giving up the initial relationships with Axe as they have to come through the 250 cap rooms? Uh, you can bet your ass that Jomo and Glancy are not giving up on developing Axe in the New York market. If they're letting these rooms go, there are going to be other rooms they're going to be involved with. Those guys develop Axe, that's their business, and that's how they got to that next level. There's no way that Jomo has given up that piece of business in New York. New Kids on the Block, 2017, total package tour earnings, $40 million. Polestar broke that news, and that's just amazing. The package was Boys to Men and Paula Abdul, but $40 million from 48 performances. Big congrats out to Jared Paul. All the guys over at Fact were there, well-deserved. This is something that seems to have gotten just bigger and bigger as the years go by. You know, they're kind of on the... You know, every year they're they're out there doing slam dunk shed runs. This year, you know, highlighted by a sold out performance at Fenway in their hometown of Boston. Just a big congrats to everybody over on Jared's team and faculty management who put that together. Some news over at Def Jam. Artist manager and record executive Paul Rosenberg, probably most famous for being Eminem's manager and longtime business partner, has been named the CEO of Def Jam Recordings. This in an announcement from Universal Music Group on August 3rd. Rosenberg in to succeed CEO Steve Bartels. Well, good luck to him. And finally, we want to talk about a moment to shine a spotlight on AC's Ted Hannigan as Promoter 101's Badass of the Week. He may think he's off everybody's radar, but I just want to take a minute to point out we all know Ted is doing an amazing job as a talent buyer. He's a great family man and all around a great dude to have a beer with. So he's this week's Promoter 101 Badass of the Week. Mr. Ted Hagen at C3. Congrats, Ted. Hi, it's Marcy Allen, president of Mac Presents and honored to be on Promoter 101. We're going to be joined next by Bowery Presents' Jim Glancy. Let's just be clear. He is on the next level. I hope you all enjoy this interview from New York City a couple weeks ago. Sitting down today at a beautiful day in New York with Jim Glancy of Bowery Presents and AAG Live. Very excited to have him on the podcast today. You know, the Bowery relationship, the Jim Glancy Jomo relationship is something that Dan and I have frequently talked about as the model for the Emporium partnership and that blueprint clearly working now with the acquisition of Bowery Presents by AAG Live. We want to welcome to the podcast, Jim Glancy. Welcome to Promoter 101. Thank you. Good to see you all. It's great to have you here. It's a really good moment to talk to you guys right now because you guys may be the only company in the world that's gotten taken over or merged with AEG or cut a deal where they changed their entire company on the East Coast to your name. That carries some serious cloud. I've never seen that before. It's like, we're coming in with our money, taking you guys, and then we're changing our name to you. That's fucking cool, man. Over the years, we had kind of been aware that people would be interested in us as we built. And we found ourselves in a situation with AEG where we really liked the entrepreneurial spirit and the people that work there. And that was one of the sales pitches was, you know, having Louie and Paul T and Luba and people like that come and, you know, talk to us about, hey, this is a great way to do our business and you're free to kind of run your own shop and have your own identity. But there's this incredible organization behind you. And one of the things that was a conversation piece was the kind of discussion that 
the Bowery brand, and we hate using the word brand, but both to artists and touring personnel and to consumer meant something. So it seemed like a good idea to incorporate that into the greater region. Now, you had a great view of understanding the corporate market before you went to Bowery because you ran the Live Nation office here. You got that view of knew how that company worked, and you knew how the bigger team worked from being both now an independent and being at a major. So did that play into your decision at all of selling, knowing how that already worked? You know, it's something that my whole life I had been part of large organizations before I started at Barry Presents. I had started at Wolf Trap, which is the only national park for the performing arts, and I worked for the not-for-profit 501c3 arm of that that programmed and marketed. I went from there to Radio City, which at the time was owned by the Rockefeller Group, RGI, and from there to Dells and Slater, SFX, Clear Channel, Live Nation. So I'd always been a part of bigger things. And, you know, I think Jomo and myself, my partner, John Moore, you know, to a fault, we both are, uh, we love being promoters, we love being venue operators, and I think historically didn't put the resources into some of maybe the less glamorous back office functions. We've never had a budget, ever. You know, we never had a forecast. We, we just, it was like, was it a good year or a bad year? I don't know. How are we going to do next year? I don't know. Who's touring? I don't know. And that's When you fu- say you've never had a budget, you're not I mean, saying that you guys were cash poor. You're saying you never outlined the year. Correct. So, because you guys were doing plenty of business before you got bought. Tons and tons and tons of business, you know, thousands of shows and, you know, tens of million dollars in revenue. So, you know, on the one hand, okay, cool, that's the Wild West. And on the other hand, it's like, wow, that, you know, there's really no chance when you run it that way to kind of assess, are we doing this right? Could we be doing better? Are we spotting this trend? So I think some of the things that maybe people in our shoes would be dreading, like the, okay, it's time for the monthly forecast and it's time for the, 2000, whatever next year is, 2018 budget. We're actually in a weird way kind of looking forward to that. We've also prepared all our people for over a year like, it's going to be a drag, but we're going to take this process very seriously. Boy, that's glamorous, right? A promoter talking about budgets and how great it is. You know, I can actually appreciate that because that's something that obviously we struggle with too is there is a moment where it's like you can stop buying shows and doing customer service for your acts and work out what this next year should be and work out what all the accounting needs to be and clean up some of those closed out shows that haven't been fully closed out yet. Or you can do customer service for your acts, which I think we all care more about than anything else. It's like the money's still going to be there later to clean up. The receipts will sit. Can we sell another ticket? Can we book another show? Can we open another venue? That's much more We make sure the act leaves happy instead of just our gut that maybe it'll be okay. Exactly right. It's like the things that keep me up at night, not, I wonder if those receipts were filed from last week's show correctly. Yeah, or are we going to upgrade our accounting system? We're going to buy a new sound system. Well, that you know, that's an easy I, one. I know what I'm doing there. <laughs> no, it's it's an amazing thing, and that's certainly the indie world versus the working for that corporate machine world. Although it's got to be a little different because obviously you knew Jay when he was at when you were at the other company, he was at the other company. But making that decision, you knew Jay on one side, you knew the Live Nation system on the other, so you had a pretty good insight to both machines before making a decision. Although I had been gone from Live Nation for a decade at that point, so. So, you know, people would ask me questions about live and I'm like, you know, I don't know. You know, I know a bunch of people who are still there, a bunch of people I really respect, people that I consider my friends. That was a long time ago. You know, when I left there, it was basically an amphitheater company. And at this point, it's ticketing and management and festivals and whatever else they can grab. Yeah, they've certainly turned it into a global company as well as a ticketing company. So what does the future hold for Bowery in your eyes? I think it's to continue doing what we're doing and what we've done. I think with Bowery, we always had a, a project or two that we were that was imminent. We were going to open a venue or something was going to happen. We had another three or four kind of in the on-deck circle that weren't quite done, and then however many more that we were contemplating and you know there are many nights waking up you know just scared shitless like what if what if half of these came to be at the same time what would happen and i think with aeg uh, i'm no longer afraid of that scenario if, if if something's a good idea they have the resources to do to do multiple things and, and that gives us a, a pretty exciting pathway to to growth and you've been in a hotly contested market here. There's a you know a big real estate grab. There's a bunch of different forces at effect. We hear a lot about problems with MSG and routing through here. New York is just a market where there's in such an incredible amount of traffic. And, and you guys in Indy had a great stake in that traffic for a long time. How was it competing in such a competitive marketplace like New York? You know, I think going back, you have to look at Barry Presents was started in 04. I joined up in 06. We opened Terminal 5 in Music Hall of Williamsburg in 07. And I think we were in the right place, not by design, but we were just in the right place as the internet took off in terms of uh, informing people of what was going on with talent and people became less dependent on radio and became less dependent on labels. And I think, you know, Jomo, who had booked all these bands at the Mercury Lounge and, and the Bowery Ballroom, 
that, you know, okay, so is Muse going to turn into something? Well, Muse, White Stripes, LCD Sound System, The Strokes, Interpol, you know, on and on and on and on and on. All those bands, frankly, Barry Presents and Jomo were right there. And, you know, I remember my first summer, I guess 2007, I forget who it was, either the December or the National at Central Park Summer Stage, and they thanked John Moore and Barry Presents from the stage. And it was like, you know, I just left, at the time, a company that was not, loved in the industry and you know <laughs> and it was i was like holy shit like the connection i was like this is what ronnie and bill graham and arnie and jerry this is the connection they had to act back in the 60s and 70s where there was it was a real partnership and i think somewhere in there i think one of the things that made bowery successful was really approaching the artist and the agent that it wasn't an adversarial relationship it wasn't like we're going to try to make as much as money as we can over here it was like hey what are you doing for the next 18 months what's the plan here where should we go what should we take it and you know i think we were transparent and i think our deals were more than fair i think however many venues we have i think only one or two have facility fees or whatever our ticketing charges were always roughly half of what the competition was it was kind of like look we're not there's places over here we can grab a bunch of money and you know but we're not doing that and i think that for the agents who were working with these emerging and developing artists, suddenly we're like, okay, we've got a partner in this. Okay, so obviously you and Jomo get the credit for the company as far as the outside world, like the industry sees you guys. But you're a big company now. There's got to be a lot of rising stars there that deserve some of that credit. Who are those guys? Thanks for saying that because it's the people that have been there and continue to be there. And we have a kind of staggering low rate of turnover but you know the buyers you know josh moore and sebastian and anthony makes and johnny beach and Catherine. they've all been there through thick and thin and they all you know kind of believe and it's i mean the other thing is that you know when you go to one of our shows you know good chance they're going to be at those shows but the marketing department our sponsor people or the accounting department you know like there's a genuine love of music it's like you know there's a who you know who's going to go see uh, pj harvey in central park tomorrow night probably 25 people from the bowery office not because they have to be there, because they want to be there. And they just saw her at Brooklyn Steel, and they just saw her at Terminal 5. But she's so incredible, they're not going to miss that chance. So there's a bunch of folks there who, you know, most people in the industry may not even know who they are, but it's a great group. And let's talk about New York for a second. It's the gang of New York. I mean, I feel bad for Jason Miller as much as I love him. <laughs> AEG, Mike Luba, Madison House... Bowery are all on the same side of the fence now. Like, is that a resource? Are you guys competing with each other, figuring out who gets what? Or is that we've got this project and this festival? Or is everybody on the same team? Time will tell. You know, we're, we're six months into it. So, so far, there's zero tension. I would say it's all positive, And I, I suspect... There's again, gotta be a serious learning curve. There is. But you know, again, the number of times over the history of Bowery that... You know, Johnny Beach booked the show at Bowery Ballroom and then Josh Moore booked that artist at Webster Hall and then Catherine booked it at Terminal 5 and then Anthony booked it at Central Park Summer Stage. That, I mean, that happened time and time and time and time again. So there's no, you know, we've kind of purposely left things pretty fluid and given people the opportunity to, if they're passionate about something, to jump on it. And somehow, some way, there isn't that kind of tension in the office that will happen at I guess any office it could be an agency it could be a promoter where it's like this is mine and I got to develop it. it's like this, this is ours you know like but offices have moved yeah. right so everybody's got that chance to we, we just moved we just moved to 23rd street we were on the lower east side AEG was in Times Square so we just moved into offices on 23rd street and that was about a month ago and you know it's a little weird not that we're with them because them is us we are one company now it's just strange not to be in a fifth floor tenement on the lower east side where it was a cool vibe office yeah. you guys like had the keg going and it was a it cool was, thing it was fantastic but you know we were all literally on top of each other and the air conditioning didn't work and we never ever had the water cooler working and you know there was an elevator that opened into Juliet's office uh, you know who's head of ticketing who's wonderful and from BGP and uh, you know, I was like well we're not going to have people trooping through the ticketing office so the number of visitors that would come and just kind of stand there waiting for the fifth floor button to press it never it just didn't happen so, so anyhow it's exciting it's wonderful it is going to be fantastic but you know we're, we're brand new you know we're just we're in the honeymoon and we're not in salt lake city which you know we can talk about honeymoons <laughs> in salt lake city we talked for a second about uh brooklyn steel you guys congratulations on Thank the you. opening was it five nights with lcd sound system it was yeah and then seven and now ten so yeah we're yeah it's an incredible run. And how did that all come together? We wanted a an artist that was someone that we had a long history with. 
we ideally wanted a, a New York artist. And, you know, so it was like, okay, who, who's on our wish list? And it, it's a short list, you know, it's LCD, it's the Strokes, it's the National, a bunch of other bands that just aren't coming to the top of my head. But we're like, okay, and we approached Sam Kirby and uh, Monotone, and we're like, hey, this is our idea. And they're like, yeah, that sounds interesting. And you're kind of like, oh, it's not going to happen. And, you know, we kind of, when's this going to open? Yeah, that sounds interesting. And all of a sudden, one day, you know, they're like, okay, we think this is going to happen. And, you know, promoters like, Things never happen the way you think they're going to happen. Right. Like, oh my God. So it was an exciting run up. It's the usual. We're going to open on time. And I think literally the day before we got our liquor license, you know, there was a chance that we wouldn't have booze for our opening. Like, and, and it, it was, it was harrowing. There's trust there, right? Huh. They were, they are. They're an incredible band. They did the five nights in April. They came back and did seven nights in June. And then we announced 10 shows in December. Those are all sold out. And if you have a chance to see LCD sound system right now, if you haven't seen them before, just mind blowing how good it is right now. And they've always been a great live band. It's not like there's a, it's just fantastic. You're dealing with the biggest market in the country and media wise, dollar capital wise, the biggest market in the world. Most of the agents are here. And if they're not, they come, the managers come, the press comes, the eyeballs that are on the shows in this market are more intense than anywhere else in the country. Does that add pressure to it? Or are you guys just used to working under that microscope? I think both. I mean, I think we're acutely aware of, you know, what's at risk and that people are, are trusting us with their, you know, maybe other than the band's hometown or, you know, if LA or London wants to say, you know, that, but the whole world is watching here and it's like definitely something we're aware of. And when we talk about, you know, what's the next step for an artist or what we should be doing, there is pressure there. Yeah, for sure. And you guys have done a great job of cultivating those steps in this side of this marketplace. You know, you've Brooklyn Steel was seemingly a piece of a longer term strategy to be able to take an act through a marketplace through your venues. How important is it to to be in the the real estate and, and venue game here in New York in terms of developing and maintaining that promoter of record relationship with the artist? I I think it's critical. You know, I think uh and you know, it's something we're you know, Boston we're certainly working on and Philadelphia and, and, you know, other markets. We want Sam Kirby to be talking to us every day about her baby acts, her established acts, and, and we want that relationship and to grow. So for us, it's, and again, I think because New York, you know, I think about bands as they were, you know, breaking, you know, the XX or Alt-J or Vampire Weekend. I think in many markets, major markets, you're going to see a band once or maybe twice on cycle. New York, I'd look back and be like, we do a dozen Bon Iver shows in an 18 month or two year period, you know, it's kind of like as much as we could come up with creative ideas and keep growing, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger here. It's just the size of the market. You know, Steve Davis, who has been an agent label manager, but you know, taunted me years ago saying I'd never worked hard in my life. Cause you know, I booked, you know, Wolf Trap, Radio City, and Jones Beach. And like, he's like, those are like, other than Red Rocks, the three easiest gigs in the world. He's like, yeah, I get it. Like, uh, you know, when I see Michael Belkin, you know, in Ohio, or, you know, the, down in North Carolina, like those are, you know, that's work out yeah. there. You know, New York is kind of like... Michael day, will tell you that too. Yes, he would. But, you know, it's like day of the week, it kind of doesn't matter. What else is in town? It kind of, you know, will let you... Know, but it's like, it's so big, it can just absorb it all. Let's take a second and talk about the partnership. You left Live Nation, you went back to being an indie, but the company already existed. How did you and Jomo come together? How did that work out? Jomo and, uh, at the time, our partner, Michael Swear, the three of us, they we had conversations. And I think for them, they had opened the Barry Presents with an exclusive at Webster Hall. And they knew that they were booking a band at the Merck, they were booking the band at the Barry, and they were booking the band at Webster Hall. And there were logical missing steps there. And, you know, frankly, you know, I'd get the call from an agent saying, hey, look, you know, we love you. Everything's great, but we're going to give such and such to the Bowery at the Beacon. And I'd be like, really? Have they done a lot of shows at the Beacon? They're like, well, actually, no, this would be the, really, you're going back to what we just talked about a minute ago. So you're giving the Bowery who these guys have never done a show at a, have they ever done a show in a union venue? Have they ever been when there's like a power outage? Have they ever been, like ticked off 10 things that happen and go wrong? It's like, are you really doing that? And we'll call you back. So there was that kind of thing. And I'd see Jomo and I'd see Michael and just out socially. And frankly, with, you know, being at Live Nation, I was trying to see if there was some kind of deal to be had with them. And one day they were like, we have an idea. We want to work together. Why don't you come down here? And randomly my contract was ending, I think within the next six months, it was like, oh, this will be interesting. So, that's really how it came about. So they pitched you to come to them, and you were planning on pitching them to yeah. come to the bigger machine. That's I don't think I've ever heard that story. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it's wild. It kind of blows my mind. Yeah. So how long did that discussion take? I mean, obviously it didn't happen to that first meeting. No, it, 
Because that's a huge life change for you. I mean, you got this guaranteed salary at, at a pretty big gig. All that, yeah. And now you're going to become yeah, I'd always, at risk promoter. I would, had always been on part of a huge organization. You know, never once, ever once, ever thought about cash flow or HR or any of the things that have. You know, you've got to do when you you run a company. Physically running a company. Yeah. So and already a pretty good sized company at that point. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, my wife Chantal, who's uh, the greatest, and we talked about it. It was just something I hadn't done before. Was, you know, people are always like looking for that. What? Why? Why did you leave live? What? What? You know, you had a great gig running Live Nation for New York City. It was kind of like, yeah, I had done that. We had accomplished so much. It was great, and it was like Groundhog Day. Here we go. It's January first. Well, I better book fifty shows at Jones Beach and sixty at PNC, and we're going to do ten stadium shows this year. And it's like, uh, you know, right, what else can we do? So, man, it's it's been a wild ride. The AG acquisition is just not the end of Bowery. It's just a brand new chapter in what is to come. So, you know, we, we touched on the future of, of Bowery here a little bit, but uh, really curious to see what you're excited about coming through the marketplace. What are you developing and, and what's working for you right now? I'd say Brooklyn Steel, which is an 1800 capacity room in Brooklyn that has a, a flexible stage that can reduce it down to 1200, it has far exceeded our expectations. You know, we felt there was a gap in Brooklyn. Music Hall of Williamsburg at 650 is the largest GA room doing shows on a, on a regular basis. Warsaw, you know, at this, I don't know, 40 or 50 shows a year, something like that. So we felt that there was a gap. We felt it would complement what was going on in New York or Manhattan with. Webster and Terminal 5 and all those things. So, I mean, it's like Red Rocks. I mean, I don't. I think in October there might be an open date. I think in November there's two or three plus Thanksgiving. People are calling for holds for next year, March, April, and it's like seven, eight, nine, ten holds deep already. So it's like, okay, this is working. And I take it shows are selling too, based on the names I'm seeing there? Yeah, it's selling great. You know, it's... The community's taken to it. Oh, my goodness, yeah. You know, I think there's a learning curve. So a band that can sell out in Manhattan... That might be drawing heavily from Jersey, Westchester, Long Island, Upper West Side. Man, they may not work right now at Brooklyn Steel. It will, you know, in the same way that when Music Hall and Brooklyn Bowl opened, people were kind of like, what is it? Where is it? And now, you know, those places are just churning. It's They, they sell like shows in Manhattan sell. So I think as strong as Brooklyn Steel is right now, I think in two or three or four years, it'll be even busier if that's possible. I guess it's not possible, but I think we'll maintain it. Other than that, I don't know. We've got, like I said, a, a bunch of different venue opportunities in New York, in other markets. There were at various stages, nothing that we can announce at this point. You know, for us, I think we closed the deal. We've moved in together. We've opened Brooklyn Steel. Now we've got to make this work as one company. I think that's really the goal for the next six to 12 months is act as one company under the roof as opposed to two companies. And it's just, it's going to take a little time. Can we talk about the festival landscape for a second? I mean, Panorama with Tillet has got to be an interesting thing, especially with the timing. It's just, I imagine you guys are deeply involved with that. We're involved in terms of marketing and supporting in any way we can. In terms of booking it, that was, it's 100% Golden Voice. You know, our deal closed at the end of 2016. So I don't know what percent of Panorama was booked at that point. I'm guessing it was somewhere between 50 and 90 percent. Panorama definitely has been a golden voice project and we've got enough on our plate that it wasn't like, okay, how do we, how do we get involved in that? What do we do? It's more like, okay, you know, if, when you walk into Brooklyn Steel, there's a, a huge panorama poster for lack of, you know, it's, you know, 25 feet high <laughs> in our email blast, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we're supporting however we can. We'll be there. The lineup's amazing. We're, we're super psyched about it. Cool. And Tillet and Luba and you guys all on the same team. I mean, that's, that's a power team. It's that's like fun. Yeah. The future of that and those phone calls must just be an amazingly fun thing with all of those amazing resources. And there's a lot of guys on that team too now, like Adam Weiser, where it's just like, wow, there's a ton of players on there now. That, that batting lineup is amazing. It's amazing. Look, I mean, I think the good thing is what we were doing in New York, you know, getting in so early with bands and frankly, taking good care of them and putting them in good situations. By the time a band was ready to play the Beacon or Summer Stage or Radio City or the Garden, I don't think the agents were going out and soliciting offers from everyone. I think it was kind of like, hey, you, you've done the job. You, let's keep going here. So I think a lot of times with promoters in a market, there's a uh, unfriendly rivalry. There, there's a tension there. There's a lot of, you know, shit talking. Or, and, and so for us, it wasn't like Casey McCabe, like, you know, was, a loved guy, you know, he's a fantastic promoter, but we weren't banging up against him. And, and we love Luba, we're friends with Luba and all that kind of stuff. When it came together or as it's coming together, it's a very easy 
kind of like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, Lube is right there. How fantastic is that as opposed to, oh, that's that guy he stole that show. From. There's none of that. There's none of that going on. It seems like this market's always been a little bit better about that. It's Denver is clearly a clash market where promoters don't are, talk are to each other. Are you talking uh, Ron Delsner, John Cher? Was it friendly, <laughs> kind of loving Mitch and Ronnie against John Cher? Well, I was talking more current days. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I clearly meant the last 15 years or so. It's been... A pretty friendly Definitely. market yes. where I know Joe Mo and Miller are tight, and it's this thing where people go to each other's shows, and they, you know, they they make sure that everybody gets treated as if they were a manager or an agent visiting. You know, it's like there's some love there, and it's a good community thing where it wasn't always, certainly not back in the day, and certainly not in other markets, but definitely is here, and it's kind of a cool thing that the new vibe here is the friendly industry. It is, you know, we're friendly, but. You know, we still we're still not co-promoting with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I remember those days with Ronnie and Mitch. Where it'd be like, you'd wake up Wednesday morning, like, oh shit, like I got to get the Village Voice, and you open the Village Voice, and what didn't you get? <laughs> and then you'd hear the screaming going on. Is those days uh, are for now in the in the past? You think God Print is dead? Because yeah, you you always assume the agent would call to let you know you didn't get the show, but more often than not, you'd open the paper and find out. Oh, I guess I didn't get the show. <laughs> now you get the email blast to let you know right. the other guy got the show, but it's one at a time. So it's opposed a, to like twelve shots at once, it's just like it's spread out over the week gradually. It's a different kind of pain. Yeah, that's an interesting viewpoint of the world. Has your job description changed now that you're not physically running a company as far as the organization side? I yeah, you know, I think it's it's still the same thing. I mean, you know, instead of having a weekly Tuesday cash flow meeting trying to figure out where the money is and all that kind of stuff, we we have, you know, kind of the budgeting stuff that we talked about. So it's kind of rearranging things, you know, I think we're still doing what we're doing basically. If I or I am anyway. Yeah, it's kind of funny cuz when we, me and Jason had decided we were going to partner, we had talked about some of the other promoters that came before us and we talked about Jerry and Arnie who legendarily don't like each other and knew we didn't want to turn into that. And we looked at, you know, Rick and Paul's model. And those guys always loved each other. And Jason was big on your guys' model. And I didn't know you guys that well. And we came to New York. And you guys were super cool and sat down with us. And we shot the shit in the office for a while and had beers. But it was like, you guys had the model Jason wanted. And it was, it was kind of funny because I was like, Rick and Paul. And he was like, we got to go see Bowery. And we wanted a hybrid of what you guys all had. And it was real easy to see that you guys liked each other. It wasn't that you guys were business partners. But you guys legitimately told stories where one of you started and the other one jumped in and there's a friendship there. Yeah, hundred percent. And it, and it's great. It just works. You know, it's, it's a knock on wood. Uh, it easily could have turned out a different way. You just mentioned a couple examples of, you know, things that didn't work out so well, but uh, common goals, common passions, common, you know, look, we love what we do. It's it, like many people in our business, we, we can't believe we get paid to do this, but it's like, it is an amazing, amazing thing. And I think Joe and I both feel the same way. Was there a model that you guys looked at as far as somebody else's business that you guys modeled yourself after? No. Cool. We won't be paying you a royalty or anything, though, <laughs> just, just to be clear. No. The, you know, in retrospect, Bowery was poorly funded, not thought through, no business plan, no budgets, no nothing. And, uh, you know, we got through it. And I, Punk rock jam kids that came out the other side. In the last decade or so, all the, the talk of startups. And I guess we were a startup, but we built it to run it and own it forever and ever. It wasn't like we were building something like, okay, we're going to sell this. This is, we're going to get it to a certain point. We're going to flip it. And to say at some point, we didn't know that we had something valuable would be pretty obnoxious to say that. I think if I had to do it all over again, I think we probably would have brought on, you know, some hot shot person from you know Wharton or Stanford or something like that that knew how to run a company probably CEO that's yeah exactly awesome hey I want to thank you so much for taking the time and doing this with us this was very poignant and timely my pleasure yeah, it was fun Jim Glancy Bowery presents AEG thanks for joining us on Promoter 101 appreciate it thanks I could re-listen to Glancy's interview over and over again so much knowledge and insight being shared there man he's amazing Hey, it's Sam Kenkin, and uh, you're listening to Promoter 101. It would not be Promoter 101 without Tweets of the Week. Let's see what Dan had to say this week on Twitter. When the phone rings and you just know it's going to be expensive. Sometimes it's not opportunity knocking at the door. It's just an expensive-ass phone call. Agents that insist a date will confirm even after management has said the artist is not available. Never really get the point of... Holding an offer in after management has already waived it off, but happens all the time. When Benji Gold points out that Vince Neal is an industry joke. Love Benji. 
He has some amazing posts, and he's a great guy. If you're not friends with him on socials yet, I highly recommend you start following him. When you get to pass an artist that was so rude to your team the last time around, hashtag voting with your wallet. Treat me like shit. I might get over it. Treat my staff like shit. We'll never get past that. You can find another promoter in the market. When it takes longer to settle a show than it took the artist to perform the entire set. In the case of a festival or a major stadium show, I get how this could happen. But it amazes me on how a club, theater, ballroom settlement can take this long. Usually it has to do with bad time management on somebody's behalf, whether it's the venue team, the artist crew, a promoter rep, someone in the mix. It just doesn't make sense. Get your shit together so we can get the fuck out of the venue as quick as possible. When an artist calls at 5 a.m. just to catch up, hashtag go to bed. Even if you're an East Coast artist calling the West Coast, it's still three hours difference. So that means it's 8 a.m. and nobody even wants you calling at 8 a.m. in the morning. Just uncool. When the only thing relevant of a pop star's current album cycle is her credit card commercial. Sorry, Katie. When everyone else is at Lollapalooza and Oceaga and phones are fucking dead in the office. I should have gone this year. Should have gone. When you get the email that Clint Holmes now accepting offers and you have to ask, who the hell is Clint Holmes? Hashtag spam. This made me smile. And thanks to everyone who told me Playground in my mind is his hit. To which I have to reply, is it really a hit? That does it for Promoter 101 Tweets of the Week. You can follow Dan on Twitter. He's at The Jew. Hey, this is Rob Zaffarelli. Addie Ann Tarleton. Paul Lohr. Phil Rodriguez. Rick Greenstein. Renatus Nachaios. Drew Pellet. Rich Mills. Dasha Bombaji. Seth Hurwitz. Steve Martin. Whitney Bond. This is Trip Brown. Wayne Forte. Steve Zapp. Trevor Solomon. Live on Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. From time to time, we like to give back. And after we grill a guest for whatever it is, 45 minutes an hour, we like to give them a chance to ask us what's on their mind. This week, we're joined by Rocks Off's Jake Snufferowski. So we got a guest for a war story, Jake, before we let you leave. What's your best? Best was probably booking David Allen Coe, an artist who I've loved for a long time. And I used to try booking him at Wetlands. And I used to call his agent and his agent was like, David won't play in New York City. I was like, why not? He's like, David does not want to come to New York City. He doesn't want to bring, he's got a tour bus and an equipment truck, and he just doesn't want to deal with driving them in New York City. And I was like, okay, following year call. Okay, with David Allen, come on, let's book a David Allen Coe show. Nope. So booking David Allen Coe became my white elephant, and I tried at Wetlands for three years in a row. Then I tried at the Knitting Factory. Then I tried at BB King's, and I was like, I have a great idea. Like, he can park his tour bus and his... On the other side of the tunnel, I'll send a cab out to get him. BB King's is right outside the Lincoln Tunnel. It'll be really easy. You just have to bring the equipment truck in. And David doesn't grab the equipment truck. And the agent's like, dude, you've been calling me for five or six years now. David will not. He will not step foot in New York City. And I was like, okay. So just kept trying to think of ideas. Like, how can I book David Allen Co.? And then I was on our, one of our boats one day, and it's in the Hudson River, and I was like looking across, and I was like, what's that boat over there? I said to the owner, he's like, oh, that's such and such as boat. And I was like, oh, there's a pier over there? And he's like, yeah. I was like, could we park at that, could we dock at that pier? And he was like, yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. Sure, like we know them. He, I'm sure he'd let us dock there. And I was like, all right. So I got this crazy idea. So I called the agent, and I was like, I got an idea. I'm going to book a show with David Allen Coe in New York City. He's never got to step foot in New York City. He can drive to the New Jersey side. We can park his bus and his equipment truck. We'll bring the boat over. We'll load him on there. We'll bring the boat back to Manhattan, load up all the customers, go out for three hours, drop all the customers off, and then drop David back in New Jersey. He's like, you know what? You might have something there. Like, let me call you back. So he called me back a couple hours later. And he was like, I was like yeah, David says, yeah, let that, this works. Let's do it. As long as David never has to actually come into New York City. And I was like, cool. So then a couple of weeks later, like leading into the show, I ran into Steph Scamardo, who's Warren Haynes' wife, and Warren used to play when David Allen Coe's band yeah. uh, before he ended up in the Allman Brothers. And I was like, Steph, I, got, I booked David Allen Coe. Like, are you and Warren going to be in town? Maybe Warren would come down and sit in. I got him playing on a boat, and I told her the whole story. He won't come to New York City. And she's like, Jay, you know why David won't come to New York City, right? And I was like, no, no, I, I don't know. He didn't want to bring his equipment truck or his bus. And she's like, no, he was the president of the Outlaws Motorcycle Club. And they had a lot of beef with the Hells Angels, and they made a truce that David will never step foot in New York City. <laughs> and I, was, I, I fucking turned white as the elephant that I was trying to chase. And I was like, I got fucking big posters up in every biker-related bar in fucking New York City, like advertising that David <laughs> Allen Coe's coming. 
well, this, this is going to be a big problem. So the day we're boarding the boat, I was like, Jesus, I was just expecting like 50 Hells Angels motorcycles to come down the pier. And uh, it turned out Hells Angels didn't care. Nobody, nobody bothered. Show went off pretty much without a hitch, though I would say... You should probably ask your security head to send the whitest security team he has for a David Allen Co. show <laughs> and not all the black guys because there was a bit of a problem getting some guys off the boat at the end of the night. And, there, you know, some words were said that weren't too kind uh, on the customer's end. But other than that, everything went really well. And I remember David showed up and he didn't have a bass player. And I asked the tour manager what was up. And he's like, yeah, we fired the guy. We fired the guy two weeks ago, and I asked him if he wanted a replacement, and David said, nah, I don't miss him. Um, and then since then, I've done David at BB King's and at Music Hall of Williamsburg, and it's all been, for the most part, without incident. Improving biker gang relations. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible thing. That's an incredible Some real, story. Some real-life Sons of Anarchy shit right there. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, man. Jake is so great. We're looking forward to his interview coming up later this season. I'm Mike Fruitman with Argus Security on Promoter 101. ICM has been making some pretty big moves and making some great inroads to become a much hotter agency, and a good deal of that credit needs to go to our next guest for making that happen. Welcome to Promoter 101, Meg White. Promoter 101, we are in New York at the Plaza Hotel, and we're joined by a very special guest, Meg White of ICM is with us. Thank you so much for getting up early and hanging out. Thanks for having me. So, Meg, you guys have got a cool thing going on at ICM. There's more youthful acts now. I mean, you've always been known for the headliners at all of the Vegas casinos, the big comics, the names, Chris Rocks, Ellen DeGeneres, Kathy Griffins, what have you. But now you guys have, like, brought back into the center of the cooler rock acts and hip-hop acts that are playing festivals these days. The team that's there is Caroline and Mike and you, and there's a Brian. It's, it's a really cool thing happening over there right now. Yeah, and Craig Brock, too. But, you know, with Zach and Caroline, with everything that they've done, you know, growing, you know, young hip-hop and just watching it go from little small baby club acts playing in nightclubs to going out and building a tour history, going out and playing the right small clubs at the right ticket price and really building it. They've really done something amazing with that. And, you know, we all kind of want to follow that formula. I have a band called Moonchild that I wanted to go out and make sure that on their first headline tour, they were doing the right clubs, you know, two to 300 uh, seat clubs at the right ticket price and, you know, really building careers. And that's something that's really important, I think, taking those young acts and building them properly. So what are you looking for when you're trying to discover an act and go... That's something that could be something. What are the things that drive the alarms for you and go, yeah, I could see this on a bigger stage? There are quite a few things. I mean, I think there's no perfect formula, but, you know, liking the music is one. But also, what kind of pull do they have in their home market? How hard are they willing to work? You know, I always preach networking. You know, I'm out at shows. I'm meeting people, new people all the time, you know, even though our music industry is so small with our network. But, you know, if a band is not going out to shows and meeting other bands, it's kind of silly to me. You know, I kind of look for them to also do what we do to build their network so they can have relationships as well. So somebody who's working, you know, as hard, if not harder than I am. Right, well, let's talk about your roots. Obviously, you don't just get to sign cool ads. It doesn't just happen. There has to be a layer of education and understanding. You said before we started recording that you started as a DJ at the College Station. <laughs> yes. Take us back there and how you got from there <laughs> to the world of ICM. Well, it's, it's kind of funny, my story, but I went to school originally to be a botanist. I went to a college that was as mostly most agents science, do. As most agents do, yes. Um, board of organic chemistry killed me my freshman year. And I was just like, you know what, I've always been, you know, a music person. My mom wouldn't let me take singing lessons. So I ended up at my radio station. I was the GM for three years and I was a DJ and I absolutely loved it and thought I wanted to be a DJ and then thought I wanted to work at a record label. And what actually happened was I got an internship at Roadrunner and, you know, working in college radio promo. So I did CMJ charting and stuff like that. But I really enjoyed the experience I had at Roadrunner because, you know, I wasn't a hardcore metal person, but I was definitely, you know, into the hard rock and metal stuff. And I got to call, you know, program directors and music directors at college radio stations, um, cold calling, which I think really prepped me for, you know, the experience of being an agent. 
because cold calling people about stuff that they may or may not want <laughs> is a really good... Or that they didn't know that they wanted before they yeah. talked to you. I mean, I was pushing Nightwish Records, Machine Head. You know, it was just a really great experience because even as an intern, they really threw me in there and, you know, I got to have a real life experience at a record label. And through that experience, actually, I got to know, you know, all the A&R guys and, you know, one of them knew an agent who needed an assistant. And I ended up at ICM. <laughs> and who was the agent? It was Scott Morris. So he was a territorial agent at the time. And, you know, I was coming right out of college and I had no experience with an agency. I didn't personally know what they did. <laughs> like you said that he was as if like he's passed away, but he didn't pass. He just went no, to CAA. No, he's at CAA. It's not mm-hmm. dead. No, not at all. He taught me a lot about technical things with deals and whatnot. Yeah, he's a really thorough agent from start to finish. Thorough. Like He really knows the game. He's up there with Guy Richards as far as being a really technically good agent. Right. And so I got to learn that part of it. But just coming out of college, you know, having a New York job and knowing nothing about the agency business, you know, he took a chance on me and taught me and I'm forever thankful for that. So you went from working Nightwish to Judy Collins. <laughs> yeah, and Tony Orlando. I'll never forget the time he asked me who Tony Orlando was. And I was 21, like a week out of college. And you told him to tie a yellow ribbon, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, once I heard the song, I knew who Tony Orlando was. But you know, young kid not knowing anything about that world. I was excited about the roster, though. You know, I remember printing it out and showing my grandparents. This is what ICM does. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, yeah. Well, anything that starts with Tony Orlando and Down, Grandma and Grandpa are going to get on board with pretty quick. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so, yeah, that's how I got started. And all because I couldn't pass organic chemistry. So, when you started with Scott, you were on his desk, you were his assistant? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, how does one go from becoming an assistant to making it onto your own desk? It was kind of a longer process for me, or maybe not long, but I was an assistant for about four years until I got, you know, promoted to coordinator. But, um, you know, I worked for Scott for about a year and then Marsha came in and Marsha Vlasic and I saw her roster and it's pretty much everything that I had loved. You know, she had Muse and, you know, as a huge Muse fan, you know, and just seeing what she had had over the years and the business she built, I wanted to work for her. And, you know, I got the job and I was Marsha's assistant for about nine months or so. And then um, I moved over to Mark Siegel's desk. And, you know, when I saw his roster, you know, Boys to Men, Babyface, and Vogue, salt and Peppa, you know, I grew up on that too. So, you know, I'm a very well-rounded like basically person. did the I love the 90s package based <laughs> right. on his original roster. That's great. You know, I am a lover of all music, but I particularly grew up on, you know, Babyface and Boys to Men, you know, through pop-up video on VH1. So when I moved over to Mark Siegel's desk, you know, Mark threw me in. How did you just let that go? Okay. <laughs> I grew up on pop-up video on VH1. Well, I did. I mean, I was a rock girl, but I, I would come home from school and watch pop-up video for hours until my mom would come home from work. And Since I'd, the TRL, it was pop-up video for you. Yeah, when, from about 8 to 10, yeah. And then TRL in, in high school. But pop-up video, you know, that's how you learn all the little facts and everything. And That'd be kind of a fun thing to do for like one episode of Promoter 101 is pop-up video, all the like little things that... The backup stories between because there's always a story behind them. every other story exactly. that's going on. So I that love is kind that. of a cool thing. That, yeah, that, that that's always fun to watch, and you always learn. It's cheesy as it was. You always learn stuff. Mm-hmm. And people always say that I'm the one who knows random facts and histories behind you know certain artists or what have you. I'm like, well, pop up video and behind the music definitely did that for me. So <laughs> it's kind of funny actually. But. So being on Marsha's desk for a little while, mm-hmm. Scott and Marsha completely different personalities. Mm-hmm. Was that a culture shock? A little bit of a culture shock, but there it's also, you know, booking agent versus, you know, responsible agent. You know, Marsha's history through, you know, metal and, you know, with Metallica and everything. She really taught me how to care about an artist, how to care about a manager. You know, they come first. And that was really important for me. And, you know, sometimes I learn stuff the hard way, but I definitely, you know, in that time learned so much just about how to go about things, what questions to ask or not ask, walk into her office, you know, things like that. So there are stupid questions. There are things that you can find out for yourself before asking. That's something that I learned because, you know, she taught me to be resourceful. She said, Meg, be resourceful. I was like, okay, got to figure this out. 
Muse was going out on their tour at that time in arenas. And I saw a whole other world, you know, with Scott, I think we did, you know, there were still plus and versus deals, but it was, you know, there's some flat deals in there too. I learned how an arena tour works, you know, looking at expenses, looking at the finals and making sure every piece is accounted for and how to calculate promoter profit and all that stuff. You know, I kind of had to learn it. As a 22-year-old, that's insane. <laughs> I was like, wow, I'm looking at Muse's Arena Tour finals and learning this. It's It was an incredible experience. And being told to scrutinize. Look at everything. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Something absolutely. looks out of whack. You're supposed to sound the alarm, right? Like mm-hmm. You're not just looking at that stuff. You're looking at it as closely as possible because you're the band's first line of defense of who missed, did we miss Absolutely. something? Absolutely. And that's what she taught me. You know, we are their first line of defense. You know, we protect them. That's our job. So, you know, that experience was just incredible. And then, you know, moving on to Mark Siegel's desk, I got to really get involved and talk to managers and problem solve, you know, small things like catering or production issues. That's when, you know, I really started to learn more of the nuts and bolts of, you know, you know, if the back line was only budgeted at two grand, you know, being a responsible agent, you know, and talking to the promoter and having a conversation, you know, guys, you know, the back line is going to cost five, $500 more than what we have budgeted. You know, the show's doing well. Can we, you know, can we find a middle ground? Can we find something that you know, we can both agree on. So really, you know, honing in on those skills of relationship building and, you know, negotiation and just having a conversation rather than just saying no, or just having someone just say no to you and taking it, you know? How much of that is the RA's responsibility when they know backline changes from market to market? If you're doing it in each city, things cost different things in different places. But when you know backlines coming in on average at twenty five hundred dollars a night, and an offer comes in at twelve hundred bucks for backline, how much is it the RA's responsibilities? Because the territorials are just doing too many shows; they don't know every single act, and something like that could slip through. Is that the RA's responsibility, or is that the promoter's responsibility to bid the rider better? Or are we like all in this together that somebody should have caught that down the line? Well, I mean, I think that's on the booking agent, actually. You're, the territorial or the RA? Yeah, I mean, I think it's okay to look at an initial offer and say, okay, this is what we have budgeted, but then it's, you know, communication. What is this actually going to cost, you know, before we confirm? What is it really going to look like? You can put it in a budget, but, you know, it's up to everybody to really catch that. I don't think we just throw out offers and just be like, here, this is what you have. You have to have a, an understanding of what it is, especially as a booking agent. I don't think for any show that I do, I just take you know, backline for what it is. It's always a conversation. What does the rider look like? Can you price this out before we confirm? Right, because a lot of the time, the rider isn't ready when we build the offer. Right. So the territorial will say to me, and in most cases that I say, it's Rick Farrell. Mm-hmm. Basic backline needs to be provided. For me, that's $1,500. We send the offer in, it goes through, then the rider gets written. And then we all learn later that the rider's actually this. Because more often than not now, the rider doesn't happen when the shows are confirmed. The rider happens six weeks before the first date plays. Right, right. And I think it depends on the artist, too. I'm Certain... sure Boyz II Men's rider hasn't changed much in the last 15 years. <laughs> no, no disrespect to those guys. They've got their show down. They do a ton of dates. Right. They know mm-hmm. the show they're bringing. Mm-hmm. So if their rider changes... Like, it'd be something, but I don't think it does much. I think they're same. They're going to have the same rider for the last New Kids on the Block tour there for the next run that they're going to go out and headline theaters. Like, yeah, there may be riders, tweaks. their rider. Yeah, there may be tweaks here and there, but, you know, it depends on what kind of show you have. Do you have, you know, four-piece band, or do you have a four-piece band plus background singers plus dancers? You know, all of those people need things, you know, in terms of just, not just backline, but, you know, hospitality and what have you. But um, I think it's always the RA's responsibility to have, you know, an eye for that. Looking at what backline budgets are, catering, what are the merch deals, you know, especially for a baby band, get them the best merch deal possible because, you know, they're probably not making any money on the show. So let's get them as much merch 100% as you can. So we all work as a team. And I think that BAs have to have an open communication with the RAs about because backline is usually the issue. It's usually production issues (laughs) when, you know, if we're talking about budgets and whatnot. So BA, booking agent, RA, regional responsible agent. Mm -hmm. When is it appropriate for the responsible agent to call the promoter instead of the territorial? uh, Usually that's a problem thing or a favor thing. 
I mean, I think that an RA should be able to call whenever. You know, I don't think it should be just in terms of if there's a problem, because like I mentioned before, it is a relationship business. You know, you should have those relationships with every promoter. Do you pick up the phone just to check in with promoters that are doing bands that you're the RA for that you may not know that you're like, Mm -hmm. I should have that relationship. I'm going to open that lineup. Absolutely. I think it's important for all of us to know. I mean, it's hard to know everyone in the business, but you probably should know every single promoter, especially if you have a client on tour. I may not necessarily book, you know, Seattle or Portland for one of my artists, but I have no hesitation in calling them up and just saying, you know, how's this going? Or if we haven't talked before, you know, hey, I'm Meg White from ICM, you know, how's the show doing? How's the marketing going? You know, are we going to sell out? What are we going to do to make the room look good? I have no hesitation in doing that because I feel like we should know everybody on a personal basis. I get that question from agents a lot. What are we going to do to make the show look good? It always comes, and I know you mean it in the best possible way when you say it as agents. Mm -hmm. Like, we want to look good. We're building the act. It's best for all of us that we get as many people in the room to see them the first time in or this time in so the next play is that much bigger. Mm -hmm. Like, the proof is in the pudding. People see this band, they're going to love them. Well, I think there are a lot more conversations before that conversation. How are we going to make the room look good? Because if we put the show on sale, you know, what are we doing marketing wise? You know, what can I do to push the artist to maybe help promote a little bit? But if it comes down, how are we going to make the show look good is probably, you know, a week of conversation of, well, it's not looking so great. What can we do? Can we comp out some extra tickets or what have you yet we do mean it in the best possible way just because you know we don't i was about to fuck with you i I wasn't (laughs) i'm just curious it's a it's a fair question it comes up a lot no i mean unfortunately not every act is packing every room right and i really believe that everyone should make money you know we never want to see a promoter you know lose money on a show you know that doesn't hurt just you it hurts me it hurts the artist So, you know, it's just a matter of having that open conversation of, you know, let's make it look packed. But there are a lot of other conversations before that, though. (laughs) No, and it's I think agencies have become very much more detailed, involved in the concept of marketing shows. You have every major agency now has their own marketing person, if not many. And I don't know if anybody reads the marketing plans on every tour. Clearly, the bigger ones they're scrutinizing, but I think sometimes you're sending marketing plans for club shows that no one ever looks at. Well, I know for in particular, or when we had Ro James out on his first headline tour across the country, I looked at every single one, you know, just because on smaller club tours, of course, they don't really have the marketing budgets to go to radio. So, you know, looking at... So you personally, as the agent, looked at every single marketing plan mm-hmm. yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, to see how many spots they're running, to see how many tickets they want to give away. You know, we do trades instead of, um, you know, ticket trades instead of probably running spots because it's so expensive. And not just radio, but also marketing. A lot of it is viral marketing or just, you know, through Facebook ads or what have you. But I think it's important to to know everything that's going on with your tour. Um, Even if we do have a marketing person, you know, I want to see every marketing plan to make sure that they're doing everything that they say they're going to do, which most of the time they are. Are you saying some promoters lie about what they're doing? (laughs) Well, some marketing plans that I've seen have been like literally listed out magazine, radio, print, (laughs) and like a TV station, like just three things listed. And I'm like, that's not a marketing plan. (laughs) Well, in all fairness, and I think some of those are promoters being wise asses when you've got a $250 budget for a club show. And they're like, we want to see your marketing plan. It's like, we're going to hang up a poster and do some email blasts. What do you want us to do? We have to buy your ad ad mat for $200 and we got 50 bucks left. Well, I've actually seen that on bigger shows. On bigger shows, I've we seen it. We don't get away with that. At, no, I know. I'm not saying anybody gets away with it, but, you know, I've seen it's one it. one thing for me to bust your balls and say, yeah, I got 250 bucks. How do you think I'm going to spend it? I know, right? Like Facebook ads, that's what you're getting. No, but literally on bigger shows that, you know, are four or 5,000 capacity on a co-headline bill, I've seen, you know, very brief. <laughs> and I call the promoter. I'm just like, what are you doing? That is not a marketing plan. But anyhow. <laughs> yeah, we worked hard to get the get to do those shows. It's uh, a phone call I'm never expecting or hoping to get from an agent. Why was the marketing plan this stupid? That's a great call to get. <laughs> it is. It's embarrassing. I, I, you know, there's and we've all had stupid calls. We've all done stupid things. Mm-hmm. Happens. There's no way around it. 
But when those moments happen, you learn from them because you don't want them again. It's like I've been on the other side of that phone call where it's just like, ooh, I was wrong. I fucked that up. Well, you know, sometimes when we have a less experienced promoter, you know, if they're coming at us with a, you know, our show isn't selling and I say, well, where's your marketing plan? And it's literally that, you know, well, you're going to list out those five things that you did, but where's the detail in that? Like, what have you actually done? So you can't get a reduction or, you know, cry because you didn't do your job. You know, it's those conversations are interesting. Reduction. That's a word I haven't heard in a long time. I don't hear it a lot either. Mm, Here and there. I don't have it happen a lot. I also haven't had a show cancel in a long time. So, you know, it's kind of tapering off a little bit, I think. But the industry is pretty healthy now. So it seems like when you see the bad show, it's usually accompanied with the better shows. And usually agents don't sell one show to one promoter. Mm -hmm. Usually they're in the network and they see the acts run through. So at the end of the year, which is kind of how we settle everybody, it's I made money on Meg. I lost money on X. But this year he was up. Last three years he was down. Or this year they're increasing. And it's kind of funny because as much as music is art, we're all paying attention to the numbers because it's our job. And the industry being as strong as it is, those things actually matter. Knowing which agents every quarter or every year make you money at the end of the year, especially before you go and ask for a reduction. Because if somebody's sold you seven shows that, and six of them sold out and you lost $1,000 on the seventh show, you may come off as an asshole asking for a reduction. It's like you're up seventy grand on us and you're asking for a grand back. Like I may not get the next phone call after I pull that. <laughs> and I'm sure you guys have to be paying attention to that. It's like, you know, every show sold out besides this last one that maybe dipped a right. little. Right. Or, you know, I think as we are, you know, promoters are friends and, you know, we don't want anybody to get hurt and, you know, lose money. But it's, you know, if it's not this one, we'll try to get you on the next one. You know, we've had sold out shows before and, you know, that's that's the hard game that you guys are in as promoters. I mean, I don't envy that <laughs> because you t- you are the ones taking the risk on certain things, and you know sometimes it blows out, and sometimes it doesn't do so great. So, you does know. it ever come though the next one? Because as a promoter, I'm a fan of that line because I'll get you. We'll get we'll make it up on the next one, which never does because then it becomes the other the next artist doesn't want to pick up for the other artist that they're not responsible for, or now there's a new manager, or maybe you lost the act. It's like it's a whole lot of hope that we even get the next play. Uh, I don't know that I would agree with that because a lot of the promoters I work with, I work with obviously on the regular, and you know I have faith in our roster that. But is the it next... fair to take to have a, the next band take a lower deal? To make up for another band. That's not what I mean by that. I meant more like, you know, if this show is not doing so well, you know we have other artists that are either going to sell very well or sell out. Not necessarily taking a, you know, a lower guarantee. Is that what you mean? Yeah, okay. So we'll make it up on the next one, meaning you're going to get the next show. That's going to sell out or So maybe we'll tip you a show that maybe you might not have got. Maybe we'll make sure that... Like, yeah, okay. Absolutely. So I mean, we'll give you a chance to make some money on another act. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, caring favor is important. I, you know, it, it's it's a tricky thing when certain you know clients have history with certain promoters. So you know, but we like to give everybody the opportunity to submit offers, and you know, we always evaluate the best offer. So you know, it, it's also has when you go to the next one, it's really about you know, first history, but then secondly, you know, who has the best offer in the market? Um, This conversation is a little going a little into something else, but it's just, you know, there are other shows that we're going to sell promoters if they lose money, you know, that we, you can make it back up on, which is something you kind of mentioned in the beginning. It's like, if I do seven shows with this agent, I know how much money I, you know, lost or made on their clients. Yeah. So it's, it's, if I've lost in the last five with you and I have a conversation that things haven't been going well, like what can we do to like make sure I get something that I can make some money on? Yeah. It's in that spirit, right? Yeah. And I think it's important, you know, as a booking agent, as an, as a responsible agent as well to know what promoters, you know, are willing to take a risk on some new band or whatever. And having that open, open conversation, like, 
you know, I, I'm looking to do this. Will you, you know, help me build some history? Um, and if it doesn't do so well, you know, there are other shows we're going to do together. Um, I don't like to see a promoter lose, lose, lose um, over and over again because what's the point at the end of the day? Like, I want you to keep booking, you know, my clients. So it's important for you to make money too. I'm a big fan of me making money. <laughs> right. I think everybody is. <laughs> okay. So we were talking about it earlier, what it takes to get you excited about a band. Mm-hmm. Something that you're first, you said you were passionate about, you like the music. What else? What does it take for, we've got a big listenership of young managers and young artists that are looking for agents. What, what does it take to get on your radar? It kind of goes back to, you know, them being very hungry. You know, show me that, or show us as a company that you're really looking to work. You know, what kind of shows have you played in the market, um, or at least in your hometown? And, you know, what shows have you booked on your own? What kind of history have you built on your own? And I'm not saying they'd have to book a whole tour by themselves, but, you know, just somebody that's willing to work, but also, you know, an artist that's translating with people, you know, I hate to go back to the socials thing, but socials mean so much. Um, well, that's the know. day and age of the industry that we're right. in. Right. It's, you know, but it's not just one thing. And a lot of artists will be like, oh, because we have X amount of, you know, likes on Facebook, we should be headlining such and such. It's not exactly true <laughs> because socials don't always equate to ticket sales. Um, so, you know, it, it's definitely a mixture of things. I wish I could, you know, say there's a, a magic, you know, combination, but, um, you know, I, I really want to see a band that's hungry and, you know, has probably booked some shows on their own and, you know, are having sellout shows in their home market. That's what, you know, really piques my interest. You know, if you're selling, if you're from Atlanta and selling 300 tickets or so in Atlanta, okay, what's your next move? What are we going to do from here? You know, build it regionally. Um, I, I just really come from a background of, you know, being hungry and, you know, I built, you know, over nine years or actually more than that if you count Roadrunner. But, um, you know, you have to be hungry. And if you expect somebody to do everything for you, you know, whether it be a manager or an agent, but you're not willing to, you know, engage with your fans and really show that, you know, you can translate with people outside of your hometown, you know, it's not really going to go much farther than that for me. Excellent. You know, I was thinking of the Roadrunner thing. There's a label that built so many careers. Forget the artists, cause, and the artists are amazing. The, the list of Roadrunner artists are amazing. I mean, I used to be entertained that Jason Mraz was marketed by the Roadrunner side of the office or in his early Atlantic days because they had that grassroots street marketing that Bill Silva really wanted. And I was like, that was really outside the box for them, and it worked. But guys like Harlan Fry and you and the list of people that were executives there that came up, and I think the word executive is a loose word at Roadrunner because it was a hang kind of place. It wasn't you know, the vibe of people going in suit and ties every day, but a lot of young executives that have moved up to much bigger and more attractive jobs in the industry cut their teeth at Roadrunner. It was a really amazing place that you really learn the business. Absolutely. I learned so much, you know, from that internship and I'm so grateful for it because I literally sat in my interview and I told Amy, I was just like, I am not a big metal person. I'm not into the crazy death core metal, but you know, I'm passionate about this business and I will work hard. And you know, when you go into an internship, you have to be ready to do anything, you know, do any job, go get coffee or what have you. And it wasn't that kind of place, but I definitely wanted to get to know everybody. And I really did form some great relationships there. And, you know, just seeing everybody out and about still, you know, some people are still at labels or they're in management um, or what have you, you know, they're all still in the business. Um, but you know, I worked in radio and TV college promotion. Um, I wasn't in A&R and I was still friends with all the A&R guys. And you know, that's what ultimately got me the ICM job. Um, but yeah, it was definitely, you know, not suit and tie, but it was also very intense. And in, at certain points, um, not an easy business uh, being at a label for sure <laughs> now before i let you go there's one more story that we started that we didn't finish because we were jumping around a little bit sure 
you were on your third desk as an assistant. Mm -hmm. And how did you go from there to getting your job as being an assistant? How did that happen? So Mark, working for Mark Siegel, um, as I mentioned, you know, really threw me into the fire and let me handle a lot of things with managers, you know, one-on-one. Um, I think just showing a passion, I wanted to be an agent at that point. You know, I, I, I didn't know until about three months into ICM that I really wanted to be an agent, but you know, I was so excited because when I worked on Marsha's desk, you know, I saw her build muse to an arena artist in, um, in the U S and I want to do that. I wanted to build a band from, you know, baby club act to an arena. Um, so I really knew I wanted to be an agent at that point. And, you know, I became a coordinator and, you know, I didn't have a specific territory or anything. And I was just finding dates, you know, whether it was the urban league or what have you, um, just finding dates and building your shows. And, um, I think I did that for about two years. So I'd been at ICM for about, geez, five or six years by the time I got promoted to agent. But, you know, it goes back to that hunger thing. You know, I, I was hungry or still, I'm still hungry because I'm still trying to, you know, sign and whatnot. Um, but it was a long process to get from, you know, four years of assistant to coordinator and then to agent where, you know, the expectations are so high um, on yourself and then from your, you know, higher ups. But um, it's been a really cool journey so far. I have a lot to learn, but, <laughs> you know, it's been really cool. Right on. I like to, uh, I like when we start those stories to actually close them out. Like it's absolutely, it's a funny thing. I, I get emails too. Like you guys started this, then you went off and you never came back and you answered it. <laughs> it's like, I actually really wanted to know that it's like the emails are funny. Yeah. I mean, you have to know that you want it for sure. You know, being an assistant's really hard and it's not hard in the sense that the job is hard, but it's, you know, there's tedious work there. There's, you know, a lot of, you know, this is going to take me a long time to become an agent. And it did. And I stuck it out. And I'm so thankful that I did. I mean, I love being an agent. Um, and, you know, it's only upwards from here. So, you know, you had talked about watching Marsa build Muse to an arena act. And clearly they're now with JBO. And that's something that happens in the industry where acts move on. Promoters lose acts from tour to tour. Agents and managers lose acts and they put more eggs in those baskets because they have to dedicate way more time to each artist than promoters who can do 40 or 50 acts in a year, maybe more. So when an agent loses an act like that, how heartbreaking and destroying is that when you've built an act, regardless if they went to the arena or not, you put all that time into developing an act and suddenly they've gone for greener pastures or so it seems right. But well, and I think a lot of time it comes out that that didn't work out. I've seen X jump from agency to another right. agent, then come back to the original agent because they thought they knew. I think on any level it hurts, you know, from a small club level up to an arena. Um, it's kind of like a breakup, right? I mean, like that's a, that's a, it's really personal. Absolutely. We think someone can do this job better than you. And everyone in this business gets fired from time to time. It just, all the it's time. part of the industry. It's not like there's a single person that can say they never lost an act. Yeah. I mean, if you're in denial about that, that's a whole other conversation. But it's, you know, you do, you put, you know, so much time and effort into building something that you are so passionate about. Because if you represent a client that you really care about, obviously every minute that you spend on it, you're like, I hope this, you know, translates. I hope this works, you know. Um, so losing it at any level is just, you know, all that time and passion that you put into it and, you know, it may not necessarily have worked out and, you know, it's not great. It's not a great feeling. It's definitely like a breakup. (laughs) Before I let you go, what are the acts that you're most excited about that people should check out? Definitely Moonchild, the one I mentioned before. Um, they're my little neo soul jazz trio from LA and, they just did a great job on their on their headline tour, and um, I'm really excited about them. I mean, Roe James is going to be – he's recording right now. Um, Layla Hathaway is going to have some new product out this fall, you know. So 
Um, and then we've got, you know, Grace Weber and John Splithoff who are, you know, building and having budding careers. So those are some I'm really, really excited about. And who are you listening to that you don't rep that, are, that you're excited about? They don't have to be an ICM act, just acts that you're like, I would go see that tonight, no matter how dead I am. I love Bishop Briggs, Nao, R. Lamar, anything in that kind of like alternative and R&B space I'm really into, so... Very cool. Thank you so much for taking the time and talking to us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Meg is clearly poising herself in the center of what's happening right now in the biz. She's one to watch for sure. This is John Schultz. I'm Windish. Charlie from Crescent Ballroom. Greg Newman. Dave Brooks. Dave Chumley here. Dave Ratner. John Holiday. Doug Becknell. LX. Imong Shaw. Kelly Lesko. Gerald B. Henley. Harlan Fry here. Jack Ross. Jason Miller. Jeffrey Fox. Joe Escalante. Larry LeBlanc. Martin Atkins. Neil Dixon. Nick Farkas. Paolo Palazzo. And I'm on Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101! And we got some birthdays to celebrate this week. On Monday, August 7th. Mac Reynolds and Ben Goldman. On Tuesday, Promoter 101 wishing a happy birthday to MSGs, Randy Fibbiger, Don Nottingham, Fat Harry Tyler, and Ian Moore. Wednesday, the Majestics Matt Gerning and AEG's Katie Borgen. On Thursday, we're wishing a happy birthday to Lori Kirby and Randy Hawkins. Friday, Rob Chalice, Jim Koplik, Dave Rubin, and Brett Moseman. On Saturday, wishing a happy birthday to Greg Bogard. Sunday, Adam Bauer and Jack Koshik. And a happy birthday to all of you from the gang of Promoter 101. Frank Wing, APA, Nashville, Promoter 101. If you want to reach out to us, send us an email at steiny at promoter101.net. On our next episode, record label executive turn author Larry Butler and the president of AGI, the legendary March of Lassic. Plus, we're going to have ICM partners Rick Farrell turn the tables on us. I can't wait to hear Marsha's interview. Going to go ahead and call it and point to the stands. She's going to hit this one out of the park, and it's going to be epic. Until then, we wish you sold-out shows for the weeks to come. Cheers. I'm Jason Miller. I'm the president of Live Nation New York, and I'm live and direct on Promoter 101. Ooh. Ba-da-ba-ba.